Thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here to talk to you about graphene. So my title is uh, Unexpected Science in a Pencil Line. The message is that with this wonderful material, brand new, two-dimensional material, go into all of that in, in detail, but um, it's all something that's been around for ages. Every time you write with a pencil, you're most likely making some graphene. So if it's that common, if we've had it all along, then why is it such a big deal? Why are we only talking about it now instead of 100 years ago? So that's sort of what I'll try to communicate um, during the course of this, this talk. So first, the first question is, what is graphene? And um, I brought along a little prop here to show you. That's graphene. Well, that's not quite graphene. That's the structure of graphene. So that's what graphene would look like if you were looking at it under, let's say, an electron microscope at a million times magnification. So that's what you see there is, is, is a picture of that. Um, what you see basically that the black dots are atoms of carbon. And they're, each carbon atom is connected to three other carbon atoms. And it forms a chicken wire or honeycomb structure. And what you will um, notice is that it's a flat sheet of atoms. It's one sheet of atoms. That's it. Um, everything around you, uh, look around you, is three-dimensional, right? There's a length, a width, and a height. But if you take graphene, um, it is regarded as the world's first two-dimensional material, genuinely two-dimensional. So what do, you, what do I mean by that? Um, if you really think about it, uh, this is a flat sheet, but it's not really two-dimensional, is it? Because it's got, it's got a length and it's got a width, but it's also got a thickness. Any, every atom has a certain thickness. We, we had a talk this morning that said that atom can be subdivided into smaller and smaller uh, subatomic particles. So obviously an atom has a thickness. So why do I say this is two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional? Well, it's two-dimensional from the perspective of the electron. And in science, that's the only perspective that matters. So if you are looking, if you imagine yourself as an electron living on the sheet of graphene, then you as an electron can only move in two directions. If you are an electron in this sheet of graphene, you can't get out of the sheet. You can't go up or down or below. So from the perspective of an electron, it's as if you're living in a world which has only two directions, left, right, and uh, back and forward. So that's why it's two-dimensional. And graphene is also the fundamental building block for a number of different materials. If you take a sheet of graphene up here, and you stack up one sheet on top of another, you'll get graphite, which is pencil lead. So basically what you get when you write with pencil is these sheets just shearing off and forming black traces on, on paper. And some of those black pieces are single layers of, of graphene. If you take this, uh, the sheet and you roll it up into a tube, then you get something known as a carbon nanotube. If you cut the sheet in a very special way, you have to take my word for this, if you cut it in a very special way, and roll it up, you can actually get a sphere, which is called a buckyball or a fullerene. Um, so, and, and the buckyball is a zero-dimensional material. Carbon nanotubes are one-dimensional. Graphite is three-dimensional. And graphene is two-dimensional. OK? Oh, actually, let me go back to this for a second. Buckyballs, carbon nanotubes, and graphite have been around for a bit. But graphene is, is very new. So what, um, why, was, why did it take so long? Uh, because it was predicted, so there was some theory kicking around for about 50 years that says that two-dimensional materials are not stable. So people assumed that they wouldn't exist. And then, um, it, but, but scientists are the way they are. If you tell them something doesn't exist, the first thing they want to do is go and make it. So there are a bunch of people around the world trying to make this stuff. And then finally, um, Two guys from the University of Manchester, uh, Gaim and Novoselov, managed to make it using a very simple, very elegant method. All they had to do was take graphite, which is basically pencil lead, and they, put some, they took some sellotape to it, and they peeled off a few layers of graphite with the sellotape. And then they put the few layers of graphite down on, on some substrate, uh, which is a silicon wafer. And then they peel the sellotape away. And some of the sheets that were left behind were single layers of carbon, which is, which is graphene. So 
but that's, that's not really a way to mass produce graphene. I mean, you, you can't have 5,000 people in a room peeling away with sellotape. That's it's not going to work. So how do you make a large amount of graphene? Well, there are many ways now for making large amounts of graphene. And I'll tell you about one of those ways. You're all familiar with gases that contain carbon, like carbon dioxide or methane or any, any of the other vast number of uh, carbon-containing hydrocarbon gases. So what you do is you take a, a vapor gas, which contains carbon, and you, you pass it on top of a hot metal surface, like copper, for example. The methane will break down to release the carbon, and the carbon will assemble on top of your copper surface and form a single coating, a single carbon uh, atomic coating on, on, the cop on the copper. So if you assume that that's a sheet of copper, you have a graphene sheet on top of the copper. And then, effectively, you take a really, really big piece of sellotape, stick it onto the copper, and peel the graphene off. But you don't actually use sellotape then. You use uh, what is basically known as a sacrificial polymer film. So effectively, you then get the graphene off the surface, and you can put it on anything else you want. And this has now been scaled up. You can make massive sheets of graphene roll to roll, so you can make huge rolls of this material. So it's, it's no longer a scientific curiosity that only exists in some laboratory somewhere. You can actually get graphene quite readily, quite inexpensively, in fairly large quantities. So what does graphene actually look like? That's a model. That's a structure of graphene. Feel free to come up to me later and take a look at it if you want. Um, but if you look at graphene under a normal laboratory microscope, anything that you might find in a school lab, you'll see it as a gray sheet. But you need to get the substrate, the, 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 the silicon wafer you put it on, just right. And this is where serendipity comes into, into play. Because the uh, substrate that the two guys I told you about before first put the graphene on just happened to be the right substrate. They were not planning on having that particular substrate. It just happened to be just right. And they were able to see it. Um, other people who had probably tried that before didn't get it on the correct substrate and didn't see it. Well, that's how science works sometimes. You just have to catch a break sooner or later. So this just shows that if you have, you, you, and also it's not just the correct substrate, you need to shine the light of correct color on that substrate to actually see it. You need to get both correct. And it's just pure serendipity that I actually got it right the first time. And since then, um, so, why, why, why is it such a big deal? What, you know, why do we make such a big fuss about it? It's because it turns out that it's the strongest material in the world, the best conductor of electricity, the best conductor of heat, completely impermeable, stretchable, bendable, transparent, yada, 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 yada. It's got all of these amazing properties, but it's not just the fact that it's the strongest material or the best conductor of electricity. It's all of these things in one thing, right? It's this combination of properties which makes it more unique. And uh, the, the, I think the most important aspect of this long list of properties here is that little thing down there, the three dots, which is all the stuff about it which we yet have not discovered. Because it's still a basic material which we're studying. We still don't understand a lot about it. So that list is going to just keep getting longer and longer and longer. And that's what makes it so fascinating for so many scientists around the world. Almost every big university in the world has got a graphene research uh, group. That's what makes it so fascinating. But like I said, graphene is the first two-dimensional material. It's not the only two-dimensional material. Since then, we've had a few more. We've had things like molybdenum disulfide, boron nitride, and so on. They're all effectively layered crystals like, like graphite. And you, you, you get one of those layers off, and you get a, a family of two-dimensional materials. And then that's not where we stop. We take these random two-dimensional materials, and we rearrange them. So you might put a layer of graphene on top of a layer of boron nitride, put some molybdenum disulfide on it. At that point, you're actually making stuff that doesn't exist in nature. I mean, I cannot conceive that you will actually find a layer of graphene, a layer of boron nitride, and a layer of molybdenum bisulfide formed naturally. I mean, we always encounter a lot of things like uh, discover something new only to find out a few years later that nature has already beat you to it. This is one thing that I don't think that's ever going to happen. So I think we're on to something really, really 
genuinely unique and man-made, which is fascinating. But at the end of the day, I think there was this touched upon before, like what good is it if you're not going to make any money off of it? So what, what, um, what's, what's the point of it? I, I really like the comment by our uh, first speaker today, who said that sometimes you just have to do science for the sake of science, and the rewards will take care of themselves further down the line. And that's how graphene started as well. Nobody got into making graphene assuming that it would make them a millionaire, or even if they're going to make a few bucks off of it. It was done purely for the sake of scientific curiosity because somebody said it couldn't be done. That's all it was. But then, as soon as people realized how amazing it was, um, there was visions of what it could potentially be used for. And some of those uh, dreams are starting to come true. That is a touch screen coating, which can be used, for example, on your cell phone. Um, so if you, every cell phone's got a screen, it's got a coating on it which responds to your fingers touching it. Um, if you, the current technology is made of something known as indium tinoxide. If you take a screen coated with ITO and try to bend it like that, it's going to crack. If you take a screen coated with graphene, which does exactly the same thing, which is that it's transparent and conducting, you can bend it. Now, you can already see where I'm going with this. I mean, we've all imagined and fantasized about a phone that you can wrap around your wrist or fold and put it in your pocket, or that's not going to break if you sit on it. So you know, a bendable, flexible electronics is something that's been on people's imagination for a very long time. And there are different components to a phone. The screen is just one of them. You need to make every aspect of the phone bendable. Um, so, let's, so the screen is one, and it's probably um, in the near future, we might start making graphene-based screens which are bendable. You can also use uh, graphene for making electronic circuits, like transistors and photovoltaic cells and photodetectors and things like that for solar cells, for the circuits in your cell phone, for example, can be made with graphene. It could be printed with graphene, for example. And you might have bendable circuits instead of a rigid uh, circuit board. So then that's sorted out. So you can get uh, flexible, bendable electronics with graphene. You can make um, composites and coatings. So you can, if you think of something like a Kevlar vest, for example, it's basically fibers of Kevlar in a matrix of a polymer or a plastic. You can make similar things with graphene, very strong, but also flexible, bendable composites. So you might imagine making the casing of your phone out of a graphene composite or any number of other lightweight, strong composite materials. You can also use it for coatings. You can use it for protective coatings, like corrosion protection or um, you know, barrier properties of graphene are very, very good. It's impermeable to absolutely anything. You can't even get an atom of helium um, uh, through, through graphene. So it's really fantastic. So you can make composites and coatings with graphene. What else can you do with graphene? You can use it for uh, filtration. There was an interesting uh, paper that was published. The scientific aspect, and this is, this is what uh, I find am amazing. The scientific aspect was that you can separate alcohols and water. The potential application that we thought would, be, would catch everybody's attention was probably something like biofuel extraction. But what hit the papers was uh, stronger vodka. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, sure, we can do that as well. Um, so you can, you can use graphene uh, membranes as filters. Uh, normally, so it could be anything from stronger booze all the way to extracting very, very precious chemicals which are dissolved in water in very, very small quantities. If you can extract that nanogram of material, it would be worth a lot. So that's sort of molecular separation. You can use graphene filters for that whole, whole range of applications. Um, you can also use graphene for uh, biological, chemical, gas sensing, everything from breathalyzers to um, you know, DIY biology since we had a talk about that. You might, you might be able to buy a graphene sensor some point down the line, but we're working on sort of DIY biology because there isn't really any standard graphene sensor around at the moment. So you have to sort of build everything from the scratch. I think we're slightly better funded than MADLAB, but uh, it's still, you know, we're developing something that's brand new, something that doesn't exist before, with similar intentions to sort of break the paradigm. So. All of this, all of this uh, amazing properties, 
the potential applications, the fact that graphene is spread around the world, like every university in the world has got a graphene research group at the moment. All of this um, can be attributed to, to the fact, of course, the fact that these two guys actually came up with this way of making graphene and finding it. They also measured most of these amazing properties. But what they also did was they were open about the data. And, and we heard talks about open source data. They were very generous in sharing this knowledge with anybody that wanted to find out. If you want to know about graphene, come on over. I'll teach you how to make it. That was the attitude they took. And as a result of that, the re graphene research spread like wildfire. And it might not have benefited them personally in the sense that they didn't make millions. All they did was win a Nobel Prize. But um, it did benefit humanity as a whole because it allowed this brand new field of research to spread all over the world. And there is some value to that which needs to be recognized. And we shouldn't be selfish and say, oh, the, the, you know, we should have sort of kept everything in the UK and not told anybody else about it. That's probably not the best attitude to take. Um, I just want to uh, end with this slide, which is, um, you know, as, uh, as was mentioned before, I do a lot of public engagement of science uh, work. And I go around different science festivals with uh, some sellotape and a microscope and a little bit of graphite and hand it out to people and say, right, make your own graphene. And you can. All you have to do is you know, peel away the graphite with the sellotape. We have a microscope. And you can make your own graphene, stick it under the microscope, and I'll show you where the graphene is. It's that simple. Anybody can do it. Um, so I think that's, that's um, uh, again, another interesting message, that science doesn't have to be super hard. But at the same time, I mean, it's not just this that, that wins somebody a Nobel Prize. That's the start. And then you have to do all the other you know, hardcore research to actually get the real, you know, to the core of the science, but it's, it's not inaccessible. It's not like, oh, science is somewhere there. I can't understand it. It's too much. I don't even want to go near it. That's the wrong attitude to take towards science in general. Just one more point before I finish. This um, model of graphene I showed you, that's probably got about 400 little pieces of plastic glued together, which is atoms and bonds. If you happen to be down in Manchester this weekend, come over to the Museum of Science and Industry. I'm trying to build the world's largest model of graphene. <laughs> it's it's going to be that, but 100 square meters in size. It's going to have 150,000 individual pieces in it. We're going to try to set a world record to see if we can do that with your help. So we're going to give each of you uh, enough to make about something of that size. And then we're going to put all of that together and try to build the largest model of graphene in the world. So please come down and give us a hand with that. Thank you.